His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for all of your goodness, Lord, for the things that we don't even know that are going on, this marvelous plan that you have for salvation and the, the fact that we are a part of it that you've had from the beginning of time as we know it, Lord. Lord, we long for the return of Jesus. Help us to fix our eyes on, on things above and rather than on things below and to realize just a glimpse of this great salvation that you have and the plans that you have for us in this world. Help us to grow strangely dim to the things of this world that attract us so much, but to, to seek out your kingdom and your will be done. Open our eyes and ears to hear your word today, Lord. Quicken us through your spirit to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I entitled this, The Love Story Continues. Last week I wanted to point out to you that even the book of Ezekiel was a love story told about the hope of Jesus Christ and how Ezekiel gave up so much, or at least we kind of look at it that way, but really did he? It, isn't his life God's in the first place? Isn't your life? And especially if we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb purchased back, isn't his life even more, you, uh, isn't our life even more his? Do you look at it that way? Did you think about the things that Mark just read from Scripture? You sh you should have read this week some of Samuel. You should have finished Ephesians, read Second Peter, and started on Timothy. Did you read all of that? Okay, now ask me back. Did you read all that, Pastor? No. So keep me accountable. See, I'm going to tell you, I, I ask you every week to keep you accountable because, see, the way to develop a relationship and to keep that relationship going is we spend time with each other. That's why Jesus had to remind the church in Ephesus that they have fallen out of their first love. Because when you do things together, in the beginning, you, you seek to do more and more things because you want to spend time with that person. This week, we went fishing with Francine and Richard, spent time with them. We weren't really fishing for men. We were fishing for other fish. And Francine skunked all of us, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> she had a good time fishing. And then Sherry and I went down and spent some time with our grandchildren, and Sherry went um, with uh, Kira to Disney on Ice. Oh, there's some pictures. Look at that. And don't, don't think I didn't spend time in God's Word. I spent plenty of time because I study God's Word. I feed off of it. I nourish on it just as much as we go out and eat all those wonderful foods that we eat. Are you doing that? So I don't feel guilty at all that I didn't read Samuel, but I want you to help keep me accountable because I spend time every time that I can reading God's Word, spending time in His Word so I can get to know Him better so that my relationship grows and matures. And I hope you understood that from reading Ephesians, and I hope you understood that more from, from Peter. As I read, I spent time divulged, diving into God's Word and everything, and I just said, you know, Rather than trying to tie all this together, especially since I'm going to be stressed to try to read Samuel and especially study it as we're going along, I'm going to give you the continuation of the story through Ephesians. And hopefully you can tie that together with what you've read in Peter and everything else. 
Because in the first part of, of Ephesians, God tells of everything that he has planned through Jesus Christ, which is what Mark read last week. That everything is because of Jesus. And you know this marvelous mystery that's been made known to you now. That all of the prophets spoke about and everything points about Jesus. And that's why I try to tie the Old Testament together and remind you again that the early church and the prophets and apostles had the Old Testament to teach about Jesus, that he was the Messiah. And in Ephesians 3, we got in last week, in verse 10, we read, His intent was that now through the church, don't miss those words, the manifold wisdom of God should be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, that this salvation that God is working out, even heavenly beings that we can have no comprehension of whatsoever are watching God work out this marvelous plan through human beings. Wow, what a God. Verse 11, according to His eternal purpose that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, that our Savior, our King, that God Himself left heaven, became flesh and blood, took our sin and shame upon His soldiers, let us spit in His face and crucify Him so that He could die for our sins and pay the price for our sins so that you would be forgiven, that you would have no penalty of death and the power of sin and death, but no, no power of sin in your life as well. Do you realize that you're born from above if you believe in Jesus Christ and put your faith in Him? So if you're born from above, are you maturing and living as Christ in this world? If you're not, it would have been just as well for you to have been taken out of this world and go on to heaven. But He left you here with a purpose to be His hands and feet. Verse 12, In Him, in Jesus, and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Have this relationship with God that the Old Testament prophets could not even probably even begin to comprehend. They knew of the hope. They knew what the Spirit was pointing them and telling them to say so that us together as Hebrews, could, would, the author of Hebrews would write, would work out this salvation together, that only together. And in verses 14 to 19, we understand this comprehension just a little bit. So Paul prays and prays, which we're going to see at the end of uh, Ephesians also. Oh, and that reminds me of John chapter 17 where Jesus prayed, not just for the disciples that were left in the world that day, but for everyone that would believe. And He prayed for unity, that we would accomplish our mission together, bind it together as many different parts, but as a body working together with Christ as the head. And Ephesians 3, 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. So how can we know God better? But to know the Spirit. If you ask a lot of Christians, they are not familiar with the Holy Spirit other than He is a part of the Trinity. And then I emphasize He again because many Christians think of the Holy Spirit as more of a power. The Holy Spirit is God dwelling in in and with you, changing and conforming you into His image. And how can that be done unless you have a relationship, that you're spending time, that you're listening to the other person, to their needs? I walked in to Sherry this morning, she's sitting there, she's got this funny look on her face. So I know something's up, but I have no clue what, unless she tells me, oh, and, and if I listen, and I'm concerned to what those needs are. And she answered back, nothing. You know, and then I asked her again. She said, well, if I tell you, you'll just say I'm silly. Oh, the t ouch. <laughs> the truth with that, because so many times I don't really listen to her and her needs, do I? But I need to listen to her just as I need to listen to God and be walking in step with the Spirit because I am listening to the Spirit. And then the things of this world will grow strangely dim. <clears throat> Verse 17 the Holy Spirit, through the riches of God's, of God's glory, will change us in our inner spirit and strengthen us. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Not that I have faith, but that Christ lives, that He's active in my life, that He is changing me, and that it is affecting how I live, that I have faith with works, not faith without works. 
And I also pray, Paul says, that being rooted and established in love, which takes me back to Jesus is the, the vine and we're the branches and we're supposed to produce fruit, so I'm rooted in that love is why I do that. So then I'm back to John chapter 13, which no greater love than a man can have but to lay down his life for his friends and we will be known by our love. Oh yeah, and then I'm into Corinthians where love is, is kind, love keeps no records of wrong, love thinks of others over themselves. And if I have love without, if I have faith without love, I'm just a noisy symbol. All these things going through my mind. But if I'm rooted and bound in love, then verse 18, may have power together. That's you and I, the church. Not individually. I get so frustrated and so sorrowful when I hear so many Christians say, I don't go to church because I'm a Christian, but I'm not part of the body. I'm not plugged in. Well, then you're an arm on the floor and a leg over here. You're, you're not composing into the body with Christ as the head. <clears throat> Being rooted and established with love may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to do what? To grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. Wow, beyond measure. I just want to catch a glimpse of that. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, being complete and perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is God's plan for you, to grow to spiritual maturity, to be like Christ in this world, not to make excuses for why you can't, not to worry about the things of this world. Oh, the things that Jesus has said, the Spirit is revealing to me. Why do I worry about these things? Why do they control how I live and stuff? Why do I fear about them? Why don't I just live by the power of the Holy Spirit as He directs me to live? Won't my Heavenly Father supply all of my needs? Don't I want His will be done and His kingdom to come? Or am I still holding on to my own desires? Am I still holding on to the flesh? So here we are in chapter 4. And it starts out with, Therefore... Everything that's been presented so far in Ephesians. And Paul makes sure that he says that I am a prisoner. He's not talking about his physical state of where he's at. He's talking about he's a prisoner for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't take just the things that you read like the bread of life and not take the spiritual part of that. He's saying, I am a prisoner for Jesus Christ. I don't care if I'm in change or not. I'm working for him, for the kingdom, for your benefit and for those that hear the message after you. Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, or I beg, or I plead to do what? To live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Do you know what that calling is? Each and every one of us have a calling to serve our Lord Jesus Christ, to be His disciple, to be like Him, to, be, to let Him make us into fishers of men. Be completely what then? Humble. Are you? You sit here and think about these things as you read them. Gentle. Patient? Oh, my wife wouldn't have said what she said to me this morning if I did that. <laughs> and the more time I spend with God, more that the, I can hopefully listen to the Holy Spirit and see these things and know that I have an advocate here living in me and an advocate in heaven with Jesus Christ. Bearing with one another in love. There it is again. Getting along with each other bearing with them, comforting when we need to comfort, crying when we need to cry, rejoicing when we need to rejoice, and realizing that we're all tied together with Christ as a head. Verse 3, make every effort then to keep the unity of the Spirit. The Spirit that seals us, that calls us God's own, the Spirit that empowers us, the same Spirit that hovered over the waters, the same Spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead. You think we can have unity and you think we can, our body can function properly without that unity of the Spirit? Through the bond of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Do you pursue peace? No, I'm serious. <laughs> Do you pursue peace? Or so many times when something comes up, to you, or do you just pursue peace? Do you have the peace that surpasses all understanding because you're a brother or sister of Jesus Christ? It all depends on how you look at things. I mean, there's that saying, don't pray for patience because look what God will give you. But as you look at things and you feel this way, but the way you used to be, realize that the Spirit gives you the exact opposite if you will just listen and take what the Spirit is giving you. If you, have a trouble, if you have trouble with patience, oh, guess what? That's why these problems come along to teach us patience. But if we would just listen to the Spirit instead and be long-suffering and kind, 
Because the Holy Spirit is telling us to do that, but we're not listening and spending time. So we need to read, we need to pray, we need to pray that God's will be done and mean that. And know that blessed are the peacemakers. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So then we read next this thing about oneness. There is one body and one Spirit. There's one church of Jesus, one body with Christ as the head, and one Spirit that drives us to be like Christ, that makes all of that work, the power. We're plugged in through Jesus Christ, and the power is what's flowing through. If you want to take electricity and think of that, is what makes us run and function. Without plugged in, there is no power. Without realizing that there's power and using that power, what good is it? There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. Oh, if we were living for the hope rather than living for ourselves, if we were building treasures in heaven rather than things on earth, if we weren't worried about the things here and worried about souls instead, wouldn't we write everything on our doorposts? Wouldn't we tell our children about things when we get up, when we go about, when we sit down, when we go to bed? Wouldn't it be what you focus on rather than focusing on other things? There are so many things that we focus and spend our time and our money and our effort on and teach our children that are not about God and the love that He has for us through Jesus Christ. If we spend more time doing that, I wonder if we could call those things idols or other loves. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And He's already said in verse 14, of chapter 3, the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You belong to God whether you're living for Him or not, whether you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So shouldn't you live even more if you've been called and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Shouldn't you live for Him? And quit trying to live by your own power and your own might. Verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. There's a but there. There's a conjunction. Maybe it's an and, but most scriptures do it as a but because it's an opposite. Because I see all this oneness, and then there is these individual parts. And if I don't realize it, I'm going to take focus on the individual parts, what my ministry is, what my grace has been given to me, whatever, rather than saying, oh, God gave me this so that it could be blended together with the body to serve the head, which is Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if I have the gift of pastoring or not, or the gift of teaching or not. Well, as we read on further, my gift is to teach you to be obedient to do God's Word. We all have to function together to do the necessary job that the body parts have to affect the whole and follow the, the guidance of the head. Ephesians 4, 8. This is why it said when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to, to fill the whole universe. Now, so many times you can get off on theology here that may not even be here, you may not understand. It simply says, who is the one that humbled himself and came to be flesh and blood? And then because he finished the job that was God sent him to do, because God loves you, and he finished it and he said, I will never forsake you or orphan you. It will be better for you if I leave so that you can do the job that I've called you to be, to be my disciples, to be my brothers and sisters. And then he went back and was glorified. Aren't we supposed to follow in His footsteps? Verse 11, So Christ Himself then gave these gifts. And this is just a sampling. You can read in other places. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And there's no certain hierarchy here. Okay, He gave these things to do what? To give good leadership in the church so that you would have people to pattern their life after as they imitated after Christ. So you need to ask me if I've read my scripture. Because if I'm sitting there on Friday or Saturday night throwing a sermon together, I am not doing what I'm supposed to be doing to lead and train you. I am supposed to shepherd you as Christ shepherds me. And I have to spend that time with Him, following after Him, 
presenting what he wants me to present to you, not what I want to present to you, and making sure that I do it with truth, studying God's word so that I can rightly handle the word of truth. <clears throat> Verse 12. Oh, he gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to what? To equip his people for works of service. So what works are you doing? How can you be a Christian again that doesn't go to church because? Because if you're not plugged into the body, how are you serving the body? Oh, you can be serving your, on your own, don't get me wrong, and hopefully you're plugged into a body that's not a normal church is, 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 is like this. But the best thing is to be plugged in the body so that you know that you're serving the head, not trying to go out and do mission on your own, by your own power and your own might. What would have been the difference in the outcome if, if David went to fight Goliath on his own? <laughs> Wouldn't be quite the same story that we have, was it? It is to equip us, every single one, for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Oh, building the kingdom of God. Because we need to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We need to know that we're wor worshiping the king and serving the king, pledging our allegiance for him, because if we're not serving one master, we're serving another, aren't we? Until, verse 13, we all reach what? Unity again in the faith. Because we believe, empowered by the Spirit, we're unified with one goal, one purpose, one body, one God, one hope, until we meet Jesus Christ face to face. Is that what's happening in the church? Is that what's happening in your life? Do we all realize this is the same mission and the same hope that we have, the same Lord Jesus Christ, the same Spirit that is changing us into Him, that is maturing us? Until we all reach unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That you understand more of who Jesus is because the Holy Spirit and the Word reveals what Jesus, who Jesus Christ is, who is God, and what He has done for you. <laughs> wow, that changes everything, doesn't it? Because all this time in my old sinful nature, I'm who I think I am. And that leads me to jealousy, jealousy and enviousness and, and covetousness and everything else. But my righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. But Jesus Christ became flesh and blood and dwelled among us. And while we were still His enemies, Christ died for us. So that we could become mature attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, what Paul continues to pray for. Then we will no longer be infants. If we're infants, that's a little bit bigger than the, than the baby stage and the toddler stage, isn't it? I mean, we've progressed some, but we don't want to stay at infants. We want to mature to be like Christ. So we must feed, we must learn, we must put into practice what good is if we feed and what if we learn Scripture and can quote them left and right, but don't practice it in, in our lives? Love your enemy. Come on. Turn the other cheek. Without it, we're tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Whether they realize they're working for the prince of this world or not just to distract you from the truth. Say, it's okay. Instead, verse 15, we're supposed to speak the, love, the, speak the truth in love. You've got to know the truth, first of all. And second of all, you've got to know it in love. So that people do see our lives, see that they're different, and, and wonder why we are different. That our good deeds do glorify our Father which is in heaven. Speaking the truth in love we will grow to become in every respect the mature body together even of Him who is the head. That is Christ. 
From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. Oh, as each part does its work. So you can have a church that is motivated by love and has all these missions and everything else, but it's still divided and there's still a dysfunctional body. Scripture's clear here. Jesus will change us through the Holy Spirit as we spend time developing that relationship into Christ and we will be one in unity. Oh, back to John chapter 17. What did Jesus pray for? Unity in the body so that we would not fall away, especially when persecution comes. Ephesians 4, 17, So I tell you this, there's a therefore, if you didn't catch it, and insist on this in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. So I have to think now, how do I live differently than this world that I live in? Because this is not my home. I'm an exile. I'm a foreigner here. So how do I live differently than the person down the road, wherever it is, a relative that I have that doesn't know Christ Jesus? How do I live differently? Let me ask you then, how do you live differently? Because sometimes when I answer that question, I don't see a lot of difference. Do you? Is your light shining brightly? Who would light a lamp and then hide it under a bushel? No. It's to give people in that room light. So are you shining? You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Oh, so if I worry about the things of this world, if I'm focused on the desires of this world, I'm hardening this heart of flesh that Jesus gave me when He gave me the Spirit to transform me into the image of God. I'm doing the exact opposite of what the Spirit is trying to do in my life. So if you have a heart of flesh, is the Spirit molding you? Verse 19, having lost all sensitivity then, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That's not me though. Till I examine myself, is it? What is greed in the first place? We're going to get to that again in a moment because he's going to mention, I'm not greedy, am I? Hmm. This path that we go down when we don't follow the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 20, that however is not the way of life that you learn when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Ah, he is the way. He is the truth. He is life now and forevermore. So how do I live differently? Verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, put off your old self. But this clothing so comfortable, I like it. It fits me, it's broken into me. I don't even know how I look in that other clothing. I mean, I look good in this. No, <laughs> just kidding. Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Oh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? I wouldn't want to call this greed a form of idol worship, would I? Hmm. Verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Well, I've got to go over to a key verse that you should know. Therefore, brothers, Romans 12, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, something you didn't deserve at all, something you can't claim any righteous standing for, you deserved His wrath, but because of Jesus Christ, in view of His mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now that takes me to Peter, which we read this week, because we're priests presenting sacrifices, pleasing to God, drawing people. Bodies as a living sacrifice, which is holy and pleasing to God. That is your true and proper form of worship. Here it is. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind, changing that way of thinking so that your heart can be changed. Are you doing that? 
Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. So as you read God's word even more and the Spirit guides you into all truth, you'll understand even more. You might even see something before that you didn't think was a sin and you might think it is now. And if you do, then act upon it. Paul said he would never eat meat again if that's what he had to do. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to the other. Oh, that expounds upon what Paul's already said here. The reason that I am an arm or I'm a spleen or whatever I am is to support the function of other body components as a whole serving the head, which is Jesus Christ. So if I'm not doing that, I'm especially not thinking of my brother above myself, am I? So we're to put back to Ephesians chapter 4. So we're to take off the old self and verse 24, put on the new self. That's nothing but a willingness to do it. It's not your clothes that's doing it. It's putting on the Holy Spirit because you let Him renew your mind, which changes the thoughts of your heart, your emotions, what drives you, what your interests are, what your desires are. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You can't have that salvation without realizing that you're sanctified and set apart for holy use for God in His service. Verse 25, therefore each of you must put off all falsehoods. Don't tell lies. Oh, okay, well, I don't do that. Okay, you don't, huh? What about gossip? What about that little disgruntled slander that you make? Hmm. Anything that's not a truth, we could classify that. And speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body, and we must be united. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And Jesus is clear about that in His teachings. If you've had anger, you might be guilty of even murder in your heart. Where do you think that anger leads to? That's why Paul says here, don't let the sun go down. Don't let that day expire without making it right. And do not give a foothold to the devil. Because if you don't repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, then the devil is going to slowly get in, get a foothold, and he's going to start climbing. Anyone who has been stealing then must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Well, maybe you don't think you're a thief, but how much are you sharing with those in need? Paul said he wanted them to give so that not, he wanted to give out of a good heart, not so that they would be in need, but so that there would be an equality in the body of Christ. Why in the world would you want a brother or sister not to have when you have excess? Do I work for myself or do I work for the needs of others? Do I live in comfort or do I live so that there's equality, especially in the body of Christ? Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for edifying or building up others. Isn't that what it should be if we're all together in this mission and purpose? Why in the world would I want to try to tear apart the body of Christ? Wouldn't I want to do only things that build up? And you do that according to their needs. That it may benefit those that, that listen. The King James Version, the actual script is more minister grace to those. Grace. Ah, what God gives you and gives you and gives you grace upon grace upon grace because not only was He merciful for you and didn't do what He should have done to you, He gave you grace upon grace upon grace and the biggest grace there that I will say off the top of my head is adoption to being His child. Not only are you saved, but you're adopted into the kingdom and you have at your disposal the assets of the kingdom to do kingdom ministry. That's why Jesus said, pray in my name and ask and it will be given to you. Oh, wait a minute. What's the next verse say? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God to whom you were sealed in the day of redemption. All right, I'm taking this into context now because this verse so much gets taken out of context. It's talking about how we live and how we're unified and how we think of others more than ourselves and we minister. 
So if I'm not doing those things, it's simple to imply here that I might be grieving the Holy Spirit. Well, let me put it this way. If I have a child and my child knows what to do and everything and I've taught him everything to do and then I see him out there on the playground and he's holding back his toy and won't play and he's mean to that other child, does it grieve me? Because he knows better. It hurts me that he doesn't see. And it makes me wonder if maybe if I've been a good enough example to him, Christ was definitely an example for us. He who was out without sin died for us so that we could live like him in this world. So then the very next verse says again, get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of mal malice. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Is that what we're doing? Chapter 5. Therefore again, <laughs> follow God's example, therefore, how as dearly loved children... Adopted not because of who you are, but because of who God is that He decided to adopt you and make you His very own and give you an inheritance. And here it is again, verse 2, And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Not just love, but love as Christ loved us. No greater love does a man have than to lay down his life for his friends. Verse 3, but among you there must not be any hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or any greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but, but rather have thanksgiving. For of, the, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not partner with them. Now, as you read through this list, at least I do, it's, it's easier for me to say, okay, check mark, check mark, check mark. <laughs> but that's not what it's about again. It should be examine my heart, O Lord. Examine my heart to see if the Holy Spirit is changing my heart because he's changing the way I think. So, oh, now let me think about it. There's greed in there again. Did you notice that? And I've already told you ways that you can be greedy and not even realize it. Oh, and isn't covetousness and pride tied to greed? And it says right here again in verse, is it 5? For of this you can be sure. I mean, he said this. For this you can be sure. Don't miss this point. No immoral, impure, or greedy person because that person is an idolater and they don't have inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That means you're an illegitimate child. You're a goat, not a sheep. Doesn't matter what you think, how you are acting. Many on that day will say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. But he'll say, depart from me, I don't know you. If you're greedy, you're labeled as idolatry. Uh, now I want you to examine my heart even more, O oh Lord, and point out where I am because I know good and well I rely on my love of money, whether I realize it or not, more than I have faith in you. Maybe you can say that's not true. I hope and pray that if my health and my money and everything else is stripped from me, that I will be thankful, as it says, to be instead instead of complaining. So therefore, I need to spend more time, and instead of partnering with the world, verse 7, I need to realize that the advocate has come, which means he's by my side in this world, giving me everything I need, every guidance, re revealing truth to me and guiding me in all truth. And it's better for him to be here than Jesus to be with me in flesh and blood. So what about this greed, this selfish desire that we have? Are we living for ourselves or are we living for the kingdom? Do we spend more time on the things of ourself or do we spend more time on the body of Christ and being minister to others? Have we put on this new shelf, self or are we still hanging on to that old shirt we like so much? Are we born from above? Born again? Letting the Holy Spirit change us? Follow God's example. This is how it started out. Therefore, as dearly loved children. I'm back to the child on the playground. And if he would have came and shared his toy and said, Hey, uh, Isaac, we went to the playground while 
Kira and Sherry were at the Disney on Ice, and he met up with a little boy, you know, right into it, and played with him till his parents went went home and everything. But the next day we went to the playground so Kira and Isaac could play, and he was looking for his friend everywhere. A little boy that he spent an hour with the night before, and they played together. They didn't fight and fuss. Do you know how much that pleased his his grandparent, his granddad? It didn't grieve me at all. It pleased me that he sought out a friend that he had. That childlike faith. Follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. How? Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Luke 12, 15. Watch out. Be on guard against all kind of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Does this spell out greed a little bit more for you? And I'm just picking one. Matthew 6, 19, do not store up treasures in heaven, right? Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve both God and money. Wasn't Jesus clear? He didn't have a place to lay his head. In fact, he became, 2 Corinthians 6, 19 says, he, he was poor for our sakes. Matthew 8, 20 says he had no place to lay his head. He didn't live for power and prestige either. He said, whoever wants to be become great among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 43 and 45. Greed and its desires, its other loves, are a trap that gives Satan a snare. And it's a road to destruction instead of the way, road to life. The love of money is the roots of all kind of evil. Do not put your trust in wealth from 1 Timothy. Covetousness, excess, even comfort can be forms of greed or idolatry. That's why Paul wrote, For of this you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater and have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not partner with them. Ephesians 5, verse 8, then, For you once were in darkness, but now you're the light of the world. Live as children of light. There you go. For the fruit of the light consists of these things, all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's why you have to take off the old, not hold on to it, not partially clothed, which we're going to get to the, the, to the armor battle for this w battle we're fa fight, facing in a minute. In verse 10, and find out what pleases the Lord. How can you do that again unless you're spending time? I wouldn't even know that anything was wrong with Sherry at all if I didn't spend time with her to know. Having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather exposing them, because that's why we're children of light. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. So yeah, when I hit this port portion, I spend hours studying Scripture about how I can be a light and examining my own heart and asking God to let my light shine more. Verse 14 of Ephesians 5 says, this is, what it, it, this is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine, up for you, shine on you. What do you do when the alarm clock goes off? <laughs> it's pretty simple, childlike faith again. You get up, and you get dressed, and you go about your work. Thing is, is why are you getting up? Why are you still here? Okay? Whose clothing of righteousness, whose armor are you putting on? And whose work are you going to do? Do you realize you are Christ Jesus? Do you realize you are His own, purchased by His blood? And are you working and living for Him? Oh, verse 15, be careful. Be very careful then how you live not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Ring, ring, ring. Wake up. 
Are we living to please ourselves, living just because we exist? Or are we living for Christ Jesus our Lord? So then he goes on to say, do not get drunk on wine. I don't do that. <laughs> Wait a minute, let's see what the point is here. Which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. That debauchery, if you look at it, you get a better, if you study the Word, you'll get a better understanding. It simply means excess. Oh, that changes things a little bit, doesn't it? Oh, I have excess of many things. We all do. We are rich in this world that we live in today. Don't tell me you don't have excess. We're the first ones to give even without Jesus being in our hearts because we have excess when people are in need. How much more should we be giving because of what Christ Jesus gave us? Don't be drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, what? Be filled with the Spirit. How would we do that? Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Can't have it without the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart because the Spirit has changed your mind and is molding your heart. Always giving thanks. Oh, there's the opposite of being disgruntled in everything else or greedy or anything else. Being thankful to God for what He has given you. And oh boy, He's given you more than you can ever imagine with your salvation. That's why we're to work it out with fear and trembling. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. Everything. Every circumstance. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So drunk with wine versus drunk with the Spirit. Not drinking, but getting drunk. Consuming a lot. You can't get drunk unless you drink a lot. Oh, so how much of the Spirit, how much of living water am I drinking every single day? Because if you take this, this staying drunk leads to debauchery. One time is one thing, but, but a drunk stays drunk. It's what keeps him going. That's why it's so hard for a drunk to, to go through detox. And instead, we need to be drunk, let me say it that way, with the Holy Spirit. So where He is guiding us and filling us and consuming us. So these other things look strange and foreign. That we only want to live a life of love and thanksgiving. A life that pleases God. Instead of 99 bottles of beer on the wall, we sing psalms, right? It tells us right here. And we do it with thanksgiving instead of grumbling. grumbling. And what does it lead to? Don't miss the last verse there that I read. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ because you know Jesus, who He is, the Spirit has revealed Him to you, and what He has done for you and what He is calling you to do. You submit. So we take these next verses so much and break them out out of context instead of looking at the example which Paul gave and says he's giving this example to you so that you know that how the church is to function. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit yourselves to husbands in everything. Husband, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church. Read what's here. Don't break the scriptures apart and try to build them into your own. Without stain or wrinkle, any other blemish but holy and blameless. Whenever I get mad at my wife, the first thing I think is this scripture right here. How do I love as Christ loved me? I can't love a human being that much without God changing me totally, drastically. And I can't love my wife, especially who I should love the most, who God gave me to complete me, to walk beside of me, because she's the one that aggravates me the most, because we spend the most time together. But then I think about it, and I say I'm supposed to love as Christ loved, and I, I ask for that. Oh, and I get, why? To make her holy. Why in the world would I want to drive her away? Why would, fathers, why would you want to exasperate your children as we're going to get to? In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as much as they love their own bodies. Who, who, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed it, care for the body, just as Christ does for the church. So how can Christ be feeding the church unless you're feeding off the bread of life and drinking living water every single day to nourish you to growth, to maturity. It takes that. That's why I put out a reading plan, and that's why I ask you all the time. And you're welcome to ask me, because this week I would have had to say, I haven't yet. Not that I'm not going to. I got catch-up to do this week in Samuel. They 
feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church. And then Paul goes on to talk about children, to talk about fathers not exasperating them, slaves even, and masters. Doesn't condone slavery. It says wherever you're at in this lot in life, because we're talking about the church, be content and serve your masters. And masters, you better make sure that you are fair to your slaves as well because do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Unity in the body when we break out in psalms together, we're united together in humble submission to do the work of Jesus Christ until He returns. So how can we do that without unity? How can we not do that without nourishment and power from the Holy Spirit? Finally then, we get to the battle that we face. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and all His mighty power. Now I want to go back and remind you what Ephesians 4, 23, 24 said. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is you and I. This is who we're supposed to be, to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, to be complete and mature, not being tossed around to and from, but knowing the Lord's will which is perfect and pleasing, offering living sacrifices so that we are mature in the faith, drawing others to Jesus Christ instead of fighting against the faith. So finally, Ephesians 6.10, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So after you've clothed yourself, after you're singing songs, after you're mature and united together, finally we're to put on, be strong, and realize it's God's power and put on the armor of God. Oh, I don't need to worry about what I'm going to eat or drink or anything else, what I'm going to be clothed with. I don't have these worlds. That's what the Gentiles worry about. That's the way I used to live in darkness till the light came to me, and I shine as light, a child of light, because I realize who I am in God and what He's done for me, and I can't help but tell others and live as a child of light. But I still need protection. I need to know that the battle was done when Jesus Christ submitted Himself to God and laid down His life on the cross for you and I. He said that the power of Satan had been stripped from Him at that time, but we still fight this battle as long as we live. It's still hard. I still struggle with my sinful desires. Paul said, I continue to do things that I do not want to do. And then he said, thank goodness for Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, Romans 8. Finally, be strong. Have your strength in the Lord and His mighty power. Even going back to childlike faith again, I rely on my dad to take care of me. I don't worry about where the next meal is coming from or anything else. I know my father there will take care of me. That's all I need to know. And I need to listen to him and follow in his instructions. So that you may take your stand against the devil's scheme. Not so that you can advance or anything else, but you can stand. That you can stand your ground. Wherever God has called you to be, standing together as the body of Christ. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, and powers in this dark world. I have no clue what all is going on out there. But I know if my eyes are open, I might see angels standing all around I know that I don't need to see any of that to know what Jesus Christ has done for me against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms till everything is put under authority of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so here are the components of the armor. Therefore put on the full armor of God. Not part of it, not a piece at a time. Would you ever do that to go out to battle? Childlike faith here again. There's a battle going on. 
I need to put on my armor. I mean, oh, did I say that? How many times do you say that? How many times do you get up each morning and say, I'm going to face this today? Or how much do you get on your knees and say, God, I don't know how I'm going to face this today. But help me to be thankful. Help me to be kind. Help me to keep no records wrong. Help me to love even my enemies. Because there's a battle going on. And each day is different. You don't know how that battle is going to be staged. Put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes... Oh, wait a minute. We're in the battle all the time, but there's a day when evil comes harder? Oh, yeah, there is. There, you know that. There are times in your life when you face things you didn't face yesterday. What is your first reaction? How am I going to face this? Oh, why is this happening to me? Or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Not an if, but when. Because the battle is constant, but sometimes it becomes more intense. When the day of evil comes, you may be able to do what? Stand your ground. All God has asked you to do is stand up. Take off the old self, put on the new self, because the Holy Spirit will do that for you, and then put on the full armor of God. And after you have done all of this, stand. There it is again. Stand firm then. Here's the components. With the belt of truth buckled about your waist. Okay, think about this, and you need a little insight of what the battle attire was of the day. Buckled with the belt of truth around your waist, or girding your loins, or whatever yours said. So there's a belt of truth. A belt holds up your pants today. A belt in that day would have secured like the sheath for their sword. It would have held things together. It had a protective plate over your privates because you're going down fast if that happens. Okay, And it was able where they took their garments and tucked them in so if they had to advance, if that's what it's called upon, they wouldn't trip and fall. So this belt does many things. So the first thing you need to do is get up and get properly dressed by putting your belt on. Doesn't seem like much of a, a weapon here, but if you go to run and your pants fall down, okay? The belt of truth. What is truth? <laughs> Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Don't study God's Word so that you know what is truth. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Don't be tossed to and from by these things that are non-truth. So many of the things that the church is divided over is doctrine that's not even necessarily has a biblical grounding. It's how I want to mold it into. It doesn't matter. I'll use this again because I use it as examples. It doesn't matter if there's pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. What matters is that I am facing battle no matter where that happens or doesn't happen. That I am ready, dressed with God's armor. I shouldn't get divided on the other. We should be united that we're in battle. To stand firm belt, with a belt of truth buckled around our waist. Oh, that also implies that I need to be truthful, don't, doesn't it? Because we just read that. The first thing that, Jesus, that Paul wrote is to put off all lies. How can I be truthful if I tell lies? How can people believe me if I cry wolf so many times not telling the truth? How can people believe me if I say one thing but live in hypocrisy? Do I love the Lord? Do I love Him with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, my strength? And do I love others as I love myself? Is this what I practice? All right, then we're supposed to put on with a breastplate of righteousness. Pretty simple again. It's a breastplate. It covers all of our vital organs. It's what helps me to live in that battle if I can keep my pants up. Can I say it that way? It protects my heart. Because the Spirit has changed my mind, we haven't got to that yet, to change my heart so that I live differently, so I don't know this battle that I'm fighting. So I have to have righteous living also that comes with that. I can't put on a blessed parade of righteousness and say I am for Jesus, but live like the devil. My deeds have to follow my faith only. As James says, faith without deeds is dead. So as I live righteously, as I put on my clothes, cinch my belt around me and live righteously, not telling truth, but living, living the truth, living righteously, set apart for God, not living as the Gentiles, then I prepare my feet. 
and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Do you put on those shoes every day? Those shoes are a little different than the shoe, sandals you might have put on before you know Jesus Christ and knew the battle you were facing. These might have cleats in them. These might have steel toed on the end, whatever they are, but they come from the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That you present the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, and you're ready to do it for when that day comes, 1 Peter 3, 15, that, that pe people see it and ask you for the hope that you have. And it's because you've lived a peaceful life in every circumstance. Praising, singing psalms of praise, and thanks, thanksgiving, and submitting to one another to build up each other, not tear each other apart. Presenting the gospel of peace, submission and unity. Verse 16, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. Now you think, if you take up shield, a lot of times when you've seen the movie stuff, you're advancing and got that shield, but it's not told you to stand. Stand firm. Oh, well now that takes a little bit of difference in how you think of that. If you think of that shield so many times, people would, when the army's advancing upon them in a way that they don't think they can withstand that army, the people link together and link their shields together and put a barrier, raise it up over them to quench those fiery darts, and they make a bubble, so to speak, of the shields because they bound themselves together in unity. And they can hold off an immense army bound together like with that shield of faith. Do you have that kind of faith? Are you building up your brother and sister to have that kind of faith? Because so many times we want to put that shield of faith down and try to fight the battle on our own, even if we have the other components and don't have that shield of faith. When the fiery darts start coming at us, what happens? Our vital organs might be protected, but we might take a fiery arrow in the leg or the arm. But if we bound ourselves together and put up the shield of faith together, oh, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Bound together with God's power, with His army, unified and submitting to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Take up the helmet of salvation again and the sword of the Spirit. You know, one thing about the helmet is a lot of the helmets in that day had tassels on them. You couldn't necessarily identify people except for the helmet that they were wearing. Can people identify you as a child of God? Are you wearing that helmet of salvation? Do you proclaim that Jesus Christ is your Savior, but is He also your Lord? And are you using the sword of sp the Spirit, which is the Word of God, not to just throw out Bible verses out there, but to tell the truth, the truth that will set them free? Yes, the helmet protects your brains too, besides identifying, which renews your mind, which changes your heart, which you got all that covered in this material. But also there's two types of swords that the... That the soldiers carried in that day. They carried that big sword, yeah, but in close combat they also had a dagger type sword that would protect them in that case. If you remember, Jesus told His disciples to take a sword with them. Do you think it was this big old sword or do you think it was a dagger? Remember that you need to study God's Word so that you rightly handle it and that you put all of God's armor on so that the Holy Spirit can transform you through and through, not just defend you, but transform you into a warrior for God. Not independently, but collectively. Onward Christian soldier, right? Maybe we should have picked that song, but song Sherry picked were, went very well. And then Ephesians 6.18, other than his closing things, sums it up. What do we need to do? Pray, pray, and when we're through, pray some more that the, our Heavenly Father in Heaven would answer our prayers. That we know from Scripture, the moment that prayer went up, we don't know what the answer is or when the answer is coming, but the moment that prayer went up, it went before God's ears and He is faithful to answer our prayers in His time, in His way. So you've got to have faith. Verse 18, And pray in the Spirit, who prays when we don't even know what to pray for, 
He prays with utter groanings for us. That doesn't mean that He doesn't teach us how to pray. He prays for us as He's teaching us because our spirit understands. And the Holy Spirit is teaching us the whole time as He's covering us with His prayers. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, all occasions of battle, because we've just talked about this, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, as you read 2 Peter, I'm sure you had many similarities here, and you understand what Jesus is calling you to do. But here's the thing. This sums up what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Are you in love with the one who gave himself for you? And are you living for him? The only way that you will is by the Spirit transforming you, by you spending time with him, so that you understand how wide, how deep, how immeasurable the love of Christ is for you. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for the spirit that binds us. We thank you that we have the privilege and honor to be a part of the kingdom of God, to be your children, to fight this battle, but to know that all we need to do is stand firm in your power and who you are, to know that Jesus Christ paid our debt once and for all, that Satan has been defeated, and that we have the power to live by the Holy Spirit as true children of the Most High. Lord, help us to fix our eyes on our, on our home in heaven, to realize the inheritance and the power that we have, to seek your will and your kingdom rather than our own desires. So, Lord, that the Spirit renews our mind and changes our hearts so the things of this world do go strangely dim, so that we can be more effective for the kingdom. Lord, hear our prayers and guide us into more maturity as, as we spend more time. We thank you that you're not a God that, that hides himself or is hard to be found, but it willingly is there for us as we seek to find you. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.